Okay, this is easy. This is called a sheep's resolution. And you're a sheep, so it makes it really easy. Easy. So here we go. My favorite sheep picture of all time. The quizzical sheep. So did you know that there's only one thing you need to do in the new year? Really? And do you know what it is? As a sheep? Now think about this. Put yourself in the sheep mindset for a second. What's the one thing a sheep has to do? Don't say it. Think it. One thing a sheep has to do. Has nothing to do with setting up gym appointments. You know, getting a personal trainer. Okay. <clears throat> So 2017, if you were to ask me, 2017, that's the year we're coming into. Jim, what do you expect in 2017 for yourself? When you look forward in 2017, what's going to happen? This is what always comes to my mind right here. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, what did I do? Nothing. <laughs> But there is one slight thing I have to do. Now, what I read to you right there is the last verse of Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms ever. A lot of people, in fact, if you grew up in the church, have memorized Psalm 23. That's the last, so that's the conclusion of this short little psalm. It's the conclusion. So how does it start? Because that's, that's dependent on how this works. This works that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me because the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. So the biggest, the biggest mistake we do going into a new year and with resolutions is think that it's all on us, when in fact, we're sheep with a shepherd. And the shepherd walks into the next year, and we uh, follow. Was that nice? I heard that too. There's, there's a sheep here, sir. So following the shepherd is a really big deal. But many times when you go into the new years, you think, well, here's, here's 2017 coming up. I got to make myself a plan, make myself my goals, make my list, do my stuff. And there's really nothing wrong with a lot of that process. But, but many times we go into it thinking that we're all alone. We're all by ourselves. And we're not. We have a shepherd who will lead us. Now, see, a lot of you said you didn't make resolutions. And that's largely because you know that if you make resolutions, you're probably not going to do them. Although you know they're good for you. And you know that that's a better direction to go. And again, I'm not, I'm not disrespecting that. That's not a bad thing to do. But what's the best thing to do is to say, I have a shepherd. I will follow him this year. And as a result, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now that is a great assurance that most people who don't have the Lord look into the next year and look into the, the darkness of this year to come and say, I don't know what this year, you know, what's going to happen in this year. I know we're going to have a new president in about three weeks. So, and for a lot of people, that's death and destruction. And so the year looks very black. There's a lot of people who are looking to 2017 very depressed about what's going to happen. I mean, wars could break out. Famines could break out. Uh, the economy could go bad. I mean, so many things in our fragile culture that could go bad that despite all your best resolutions, you have no way of guaranteeing your future. But if you have a shepherd, you do. It's very different. It's a very different mindset. Now, when I, when I make plans going into the new year or anything, I make plans and I say, well, Lord, I want you to be glorified in what's going to happen next. And, and I know that you've put me in this position to have to wrestle over making plans and, and you haven't just told me what to do because you don't want me to be a robot. So here I am, Lord. I'm wrestling with how to plan for the future. But I want to follow you in my plan making. I want to follow you in these goals. I, I want whatever you want to be. I want to follow you. So it's always important when you're doing planning is to say, Lord, not my will but yours be done. And now you've entrusted to me to have to make some decisions. And Lord, I would so much prefer if you just said, do this, Jim. But he doesn't. And why? Because in the process of wrestling through the decisions and coming to him frequently saying, I want your will to be done, not mine, you start to think more like the shepherd. What do you want? Where are things going for you? And that's, that's what's important because as you set plans in the new year, it's really not about you. It's about him. And that's what changes it all. That's what changes everything, absolutely everything. And with that, when you follow him, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That is just an extraordinary promise. Now, this, this psalm, if you know Psalm 23, seems kind of, oh, what do you want to call it? Unicorny and fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it seems, it seems too good to be true, really, uh, because, because it's a shepherd psalm in that particular sense. But if, you, if that's what you think about Psalm 23, you never read the last half of it. And let me, let me show you what I mean, because here, what happens if there's enemies? Does anyone have enemies? <clears throat> well, we all do, actually. 
He puts in the last half of this, the second to last verse, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. So he acknowledges near the end of this, it's not all rosy and rainbows and unicorns. You have enemies, but even in the worst circumstances, which is when your enemies would rather see you die and starve, you, my shepherd, set a table for me in their midst and I don't want for anything. And the anointing phrase right there, you anoint my head with oil, that's a phrase that's more usually used for anointing a king. That's what David, when he was a boy, was, had his head anointed with oil from Samuel. It's a way of God saying, I, I treasure you, I love you, I've appointed you for a purpose, I know who you are, I've got great plans for you that will never be shaken. That's, that's kind of the rough summary of what that is. So even in the midst of your enemies, you can say, God has anointed my head with oil, he's put his hand on my head, He says, you're special to me. I have plans for you. Forget about the enemies. What you have to focus on is my hand on your head. Anointed your head with oil and my cup overflows. So even when your enemies would rather you starve and die, if you have a shepherd, in the midst of your enemies, your cup overflows. (laughs) So see, this is a very realistic psalm. I have a shepherd. I follow him. Goodness and mercy will follow me. But even when I'm sitting in the midst of my enemies, and, and for a sheep, your greatest enemy is wolves even as you sit in the midst of wolves he says it's okay you're mine i have appointed a plan for you that will never be shaken and you'll never be in want yeah really and this works because the beginning of the psalm he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters now many people look at that verse too and think well that's why this is kind of a rainbowy sort of (laughs) unrealistic thing but those two verses two and five actually go together you can live in the midst of your enemies and also be lying down in green pastures they go together because from god's perspective whether you're actually in literal grassy pastures or whether you're living in the threat of your enemies it's all the same you would still be blessed because he's there so so he's saying he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he's a great shepherd and even in the midst of my enemies it doesn't break the promise of verse two i can be in the midst of my enemies and actually be in green pastures now see what what happens is that many times we look at verse two and when the new year comes around and something terrible happens in your life you'll scoff and say huh green pastures i don't think so Huh, cup overflowing? I don't think so. Still waters? No, my waters are... They're doing this. And you'll look at that and you'll say, this has nothing to do with Psalm 23. Maybe God is lying to me as my shepherd. But the reality is, regardless of where you go, you're with the shepherd. And your cup overflows. And goodness and mercy follow you. The circumstance is a secondary issue. Did you catch that? It's not so much what happens around you, because it can be enemies or turbulent water or calm water. It's not what happens around you. It's who you're with that changes it. It's who you're with. Now, no one would ever look at the lives of the apostles, follow the early lives of the apostles, and say that they had verse 2 lives on the outside, circumstantially. I mean, all the apostles except John were, were martyred. They had tough lives starting from the very beginning. So you, you just can't say that when you follow Jesus, you're going to have green pastures circumstantially but in the presence of a shepherd yes even though the circumstances go to pot the shepherd's there it's his nearness that changes the circum- the circumstance not the circumstance itself now you, you in fact you already know this if you if you have if you live with someone that you love tremendously you can go through the worst circumstances of life i mean things just <laughs> They are not pastures and they are not still waters, <laughs> right? And we all know this. And yet something about the nearness of the one you love transforms the circumstance. And years later, you look back and say, wow, that was really bad back then, but I had you and that changed everything. Relationship changes everything. Well, he's saying your relationship with the shepherd changes every circumstance into a green pasture and still waters. You see that? So he's trying to tell you. He does another one right here. These are actually mirrored together. What about death itself? The worst news ever. (laughs) How do you deal with that? Well, at the end, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. See, there it is. Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's the way that he directs you. 
and disciplines you and says, no, nah, you don't want to go over there. Nah, let's go over here. Uh, look, 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 look at this. Why should I? Well, I, we'll just do that. So, so he's constantly there. That rod and his staff is a great encouragement about the fact that he's near me and he continues to have an intimate touch into my life. And if you let him guide you, he'll guide you in the right directions. Even when you're talking about walking in the valley of the shadow of death. I need sound effects. That's a, that's a very bad thing. I mean, that's darkness, it's death and destruction. So see, this is, not, this is not just a rainbow unicorn kind of psalm. He's saying that even when I live in the midst of my enemies who want to see me dead, and even when I live in the very presence of death itself, you're my shepherd, you're near me, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. You see the contrast? Now David himself lived through this. Before he became king, after Samuel had anointed him king by putting his hand on his head and the oil and all that kind of stuff, Saul found out that David was going to be the next king, and Saul didn't like that. So Saul decided to to take all the armies of Israel and chase David and kill him. Saul himself tried to kill David when he was in his room, and Saul would hurl spears at him. David had to run for his life. Now, we don't know when David wrote this psalm, but David wrote this psalm, and he ran all by himself for, for years away from the military of Israel with Saul saying, I'm going to have him dead. And he says to himself, Even when I'm with my enemies and when I walk into certain death, goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. I let him be my shepherd. David was, is it, you know, David's vocation before he became king? Shepherd. So he knew what sheep had to do. And he understood that his job, once he became king, was not, was just a kind of an under shepherd for the owner of the sheep of Israel. He understood the sheep-shepherd relationship really well. So here you go. Even though I walked there, but look what he says where we'll go here. Three, he restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness. Now how in the world is a path of righteousness compatible with the valleys of the shadow of death? Do, Do those go together? But you see, that's what he's doing. He starts off at one, two, and three, telling you how God sees your circumstance and goes out at the end telling you how sometimes you see your circumstance, but they're actually one and the same because he's with us. Paths of righteousness can be walked in the valley of the shadow of death. And I'll fear no evil because he's close. But it's actually a path of righteousness. That's the amazing thing in all of this. The first part looks like it's a unicorn rainbow story. (laughs) And the last part looks like death and destruction. And then he closes the whole thing by saying, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's a very realistic psalm of the problems of life and the, and the reason we have hope looking forward has nothing to do with you transforming your circumstance and has everything with him walking with you through your circumstance. And he says it so clearly right here. He says it so clearly. He never answered the question, why? Why is it that God does this in my life? And right here in the very central core of the, of the psalm, he says why. You see, we worked our way in from the last and first verse, the second and second and last verse, third verse, and then right in the center, this is like a bullseye on the way he's designed this, right? And the bullseye is the why. And the why is for his name's sake. Not because you're anything great. But for his namesake, what does that mean? It means he acts with you as the shepherd in a way that reflects who he is, his namesake. Who is he? What is John? John the apostle says God is love. Love. God is love. God is compelled to love you because he is love. That's his namesake. That's his reputation right there. Let, let me show you. There's a place. There's another psalm I like. This Psalm 109, 21 says it. But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your chesed, steadfast love, your chesed is good, deliver me. Because you are good and you love, I can expect you to deliver me. Not because I'm worthy, but because that's who you are. Isn't it an incredible promise to know that you have a shepherd who can't stop himself from loving you? Because that's what he is. We understand this too with parents and children. We understand that a parent can't disregard their love for their child. And when something happens to their child, they're brokenhearted about it. It hurts inside. Because that's the way we are. We're parents. 
He's saying that's the way your God is. You have a God who can't stop himself from loving you. That's why when you follow that shepherd, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. So don't lose your perspective going into 2017. It's not because of who I am or because I'm so great. It's because of who he is. His namesake, because of who he is. So who's your shepherd? And this is a very important point. The Lord is my shepherd. And you realize he doesn't say, the Lord is the shepherd. There's a possessive word there. He's my shepherd. That means that when you turn into a new year and something like this, you've got to ask yourself, who am I following? Am I following me? Am I following the shepherd who can't stop himself in loving you? Now, it's possible for you to not follow him in the new year. <clears throat> and you do so at your own risk. <laughs> Because if you've seen sheep with a shepherd where there's wolves around the periphery, a sheep that says, you know, I'm really out of here. I'm doing okay. I'm going to go off in the woods and I'm going to have a great time all by myself. Well, without the shepherd close by, you put yourself in great harm. And that's what happens when we do this, when we don't follow the Lord into the year, but we say, I've got this, God. Thanks. I'll do this. The life of a Christian follower of Jesus should be a life of increasing dependence on him, not increasing independence. So it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. So when you follow the shepherd, do you know what follows you? Goodness and mercy. That is just like so simple. So don't let that go away this year. Make your plans about things you want to see change and all that kind of stuff. That's okay. Ask the Lord what he wants, what his desire is, but say, you know, Lord, but it's not my plans that are important. It's your plans that are important. I want to follow the shepherd who loves me with a love that will not stop. Will you inform my steps? There's another psalm that says the steps of a man are established by the Lord and he delights in his way. So follow the shepherd. That's really the biggest thing you have to do. And then put all your plans under that. Say, Lord, I want to go where you're going. I want to go where you're leading. Because I understand that if I follow the shepherd, goodness and mercy will follow me. I love the image. Not him, but something else. Okay, here's our tendency and there's the last thing I'll say. Our tendency as sheep <laughs> is to fly. <laughs> I looked a long time for that picture. And, and Peter says it, 1 Peter 2.25, he says, for you were straying like sheep. He's, he's actually repeating what's in Isaiah 53. You were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So if you gave your life to him that way, give your life to him this year the same way. You are the shepherd and overseer of my soul. I'm a sheep. You're the loving shepherd. Let's do this. That's the best resolution you can do. The best resolution. Don't, don't get out. Don't do this. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so what I want to do right now is I want to read this as a benediction, and then we're going to sing one song, and then we'll be out of here. So if, uh, if the music team want to come up right now and get in place, and I'm going to read this last verse of the book of Hebrews as our benediction that starts us into 2017, and there's sheep in this verse. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I call this the sheep benediction. So why don't you stand? I'll read this as our benediction. Stay standing we'll, and we'll sing one more song right after that. So here's what, Saul, this is what Hebrews 13 says as the benediction. It's actually his closing prayer for the entire book. He says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, woo the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.